Welcome to Massey College. Uh, welcome to the Music Salon. This is the way in which we try to celebrate the great talent of Toronto, and we're so delighted to ha be here tonight to, to listen to great jazz. So <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Nathalie Desrosiers. I'm the principal of Massey College, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you in this place. I want to acknowledge that uh, this is indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wendat and the Seneca, and it is a treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, for whom we are, you know, in partnership with and and kind of committing to holding this land with uh, stewardship and also acknowledging the great privilege that we have to be here. Uh, so this, I'm so excited tonight. We're so happy to have uh, both uh, Rich Brown and Sam Lajol, who's a uh, junior fellow. And thank you for being here, actually. We need music so desperately, <laughs> and we really want to celebrate the great talent here and the, the great spirit uh, that this music salon is bringing. So thank you to Mary McGear, who's the organizer. And I'm going to pass it to Hannah, that's going to lead us in this uh, this uh, great event. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Natalie, for the land acknowledgement and introduction to tonight's Massey Music Salon. And welcome to everyone here and to everyone online. Um, joining us online, as Natalie noted, I'm Hannah Chan Hartley. I'm a musicologist a Quadrangle Society member at Massey College and host of tonight's uh, event as one of the members of the programming committee for the Massey College Music Society. And tonight, we're delighted to present a jazz-themed music salon entitled New Origins on the Edge of Jazz with internationally renowned Canadian musician Rich Brown and junior fellow musician Sam Little. And I'll introduce our guests um, more thoroughly and then let Sam take over to guide us through tonight's event. But before I do that, I just want to let everyone know that there will be a Q&A um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, for those of you watching online, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to share, please do so in the chat column on the right side of your video stream screen, and we'll select from those. So to introduce our guests, Rich Brown is a Canadian electric bassist, composer, educator, producer, and broadcaster. He has played, toured, and recorded with some of the most distinguished musicians on the planet, including James Blood Ulmer, Vernon Reed, Steve Coleman, Rujesh Mahansapa, uh, Angelique Kidjo, David Clayton Thomas of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Jane Sibbery, Kim Mitchell, the J. Iyer, and Kirk Elling. He also leads his own groups, Rinse the Algorithm and The Abing. He was nominated for a Juno Award in the category of Jazz Album of the Year, solo, for his 2016 al album, Abeng. In all, he has recorded three albums as a leader and is featured on over 70 recordings covering a wide range of musical genres. He is the host of his own weekly online radio show, New Origins, on jazzcast.ca and has a well-regarded YouTube channel called The Brownstone, dedicated to bass music education. Sam Little is a bassist, composer, arranger, and educator originally from Winnipeg <coughs> and now based in Toronto. He plays both electric and upright bass in a wide variety of genres from jazz to folk and R&B. He has performed with numerous artists including Quincy Davis, Lenny Chet Bro, Mira Black, George Culligan, and Ron Paley. He is currently completing a DMA in jazz bass performance at the University of Toronto. He has featured explores the connection between attention and interaction in jazz performance. Sam also works as a course instructor guiding young improvisers in their journey toward jazz proficiency. And he chairs the Ken Page Memorial Trust Masterclass Committee charged with selecting and hosting guest artists at the Faculty of Music. Please welcome Rich and Sam. <laughs> Thanks very much. Over to you, Sam. Sam. Appreciate it, that was, that was a great intro. Um, so I guess first I just want to thank you, Rich, for joining us today. I mean, uh, it's truly an honor. I've had the great pleasure to get to know you over this past year a little bit more and learn from you, uh, which has uh, been awe-inspiring, I think, in many real ways. So uh, I'm grateful that you, you decided to join us again this evening. Uh, I'm honored. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, now, with that said, um, 
I mean, we've had lots of conversations about music over the last year, I'd say. I mean, our lessons end up turning oftentimes more into conversation than just about anything else. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been wonderful for me, just getting a chance to pick your brain weekly. Uh, and so hopefully we can maybe publicize that in some kind of Sure. Um, just us, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I guess, I mean, uh, really, if you're cool with it, maybe we could start off with a piece and sure. then start talking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that might just inform the way that we, we kind of move forward. Absolutely. Um, okay. That's a piece called ukudlala, which is a Zulu word that means uh, play or to play. Okay. Well, I mean, it's playful. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> okay. I, I have a lot of questions about that piece in particular, but maybe we can come back to that. Today. Sure. Um, so I guess the first, the first thing that I like would love to hear about um, is is your early experiences and like what brought you to playing the bass specifically, or was it your first instrument? Uh, and and like maybe what were you drawn to about it as an instrument? Um, it wasn't my first instrument. I started as a guitar player when I was very young. I t I took lessons when I think I was like six years old. Okay. And I hated taking lessons. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Because, uh, you know, you're a kid, you want to burn, and you don't want to play like Mary Had a Little Lamb. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so I, st I stopped taking lessons for a little while, and I just sort of put the guitar down. And then I, uh, I, I kind of picked it up again when I was 13 and got sort of serious about it when I really wanted to be a guitar player. And I, at that time, I was all about, like, uh, you know, Mark Knopfler and Eddie Van Halen and Hendrix and... Um, and Stevie Ray Vaughan, like he was a huge okay. influence for me. Was this like the late 70s, early 80s? This would have been, yeah, early 80s, okay. like 83. I yeah, guess. so like right at that heyday. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, so I kept going with that. And then when I got to high school, there were a million guitar players. <laughs> and I felt like they were all better than me. But there were no bass players. Mm -hmm. So all these guitar players needed bass players. I was like, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> 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 Which is a stupid question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so when I was 17, I switched over to bass and really got into, like, well, of course, Jaco Pistorius. But I guess, you know, when I started playing this instrument, I was uh, listening to the radio and trying as hard as I could to play all of the songs that came on the radio mm. and try to have them learned um, by the end of the song, which was not hard to do for pop radio, mm -hmm. like especially, you know, top 40 pop radio where they play the same songs over and over again all day long. So I'd be like, you know, I'd be listening to the radio and learning the tunes and then that song would come up again and I'd be like, oh, I know this. I got this one. Um, so that really helped to develop my ear. And then when I got out and started playing with other uh, musicians, um, it just really helped me to learn the material mm -hmm. and, and, and fit in uh, in jam situations. And um, yeah, w when I was 17, that's when it really sort of started for me. Okay. And yeah. did when you got into the, I guess, the working music community, did you start out playing jazz or was it like pop and R&B gigs or like what? <laughs> um, I was 19, I think, and uh, I got into a Rush cover band. Okay. <laughs> I mean, YYZ and yeah, all that Tom stuff. Sawyer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine in high school um, named Jeremy Green, who designed the first um, Rinciago rhythm record, mm. um, he was a guitar player, and he had this band. His brother played bass. Uh, and his brother quit the band, so he asked me if I'd be interested in doing it. I was like, yeah, man, no problem. And he said, okay, well, we play Rush. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, who's Rush? <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me all these albums, and, um, and I really got into it. I was, like, I never heard music that had, you know, mixed meter and odd time signatures. Okay. So I was way down. Um, so I learned all the tunes and really got into it, and... And it was a few years after that, I mean, I'm sort of skipping over some stuff, but like a few years after that, I was just trying to like see where I fit in because, mm. I, you know, we would play these shows and um, I'd kind of stick out like fly in the buttermilk, you know what I mean? Mm. So um, after that, I heard Steve Coleman for the first time. Mm. And then that was like, okay, this is... This is where it makes sense. Yeah, this is your sort of musical home because mm. that had all of those, those uh, crazy rhythms, but it also had a really deep funk element, which, sure. was, which was like the music that played in my house when I was very young. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's where everything sort of changed. So maybe can we like linger on that? Does it, like, I'm looking at the audience here and I would probably take a reasonable guess that no one has heard of Steve Coleman before. Right. So <coughs> when we talk about that music and Steve Coleman, who is a saxophone player, an American saxophone player from Chicago, yes, um, who created a style of music called M bass. So what what do what do we mean when we're talking about that music? Um, <coughs> that music is really based on African rhythms um, that have, I guess, sort of unusual rhythmic structures. Mm. Um, and uh, they're not just odd time signatures per se, they get into more sort of complex meter and, and things that are really based on uh, rhythmic cycles that are known as drum chants, where the drum part is um, com through composed. 
and uh, well, not through composed. It's like a it's a, a a written cycle, and then everyone in the band learns this cycle, um, and then once we're all familiar with that, then the time signature doesn't matter. We don't have to count the music or anything like that. Mm. We just learn this, you know, what basically becomes the main melody melody of the tune, which is the drum chant, and. Um, that allows us to just get inside the music in a different way so that it's not, you know, playing these hard tunes and counting our way through them. It's just playing to this learned rhythmic structure, pattern. Right. Would you be so kind as to demonstrate a drum, ch a drum chant for us? Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. This is one that I learned uh, with a band called Dap Theory. Um, and the song is called Summons to the Dance. We talked about this. Yeah, song. we did. Yeah. And it's a long drum chant. You could say that it's in five, um, but it's a very long chant. It goes like this. <laughs> you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> Uh, so that's ex that's an example of a drum chant. Mm. So that's what the drummer is playing as we play our parts over that uh, line. Um, and again, once you have that chant, it really makes you think of the music in a different way mm. because you're not thinking of numbers anymore. Sure. Right? And when you have this other sort of main melody in your head, it allows you to really get inside the music. Mm -hmm. And feel it in a different way where yeah, it becomes totally. about like just internalizing that rhythm exactly. and everything draws reference to that even if you're not explicitly playing it right yeah, yeah. it's uh, like a clave yeah it's like a clave so for those who are unfamiliar with a clave in uh afro-cuban music and a lot of music from latin america as well as from africa uh there is this what is traditionally known as like a son clave or a three two clave or two three clave which is <coughs> <coughs> So, three, two, or two, three. And so that's a clave, and it's called a clave because it's played on a clave, um, the two wooden sticks. And that is the anchor to a great deal of music from that part of the world. So the drum chant is like that, but in maybe maximum. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so you found Steve Coleman's music, and y you just started learning, getting inside of it? Yeah, I started learning the tunes, um, but I didn't know anything about drum chants when I started learning. Sure, yeah. So I was just trying to figure out the time signatures and the patterns, and, and I heard that there was like some structure in the drum part, but I didn't really pay that much attention to it. I was just sort of trying to learn the bass lines, and, uh, and then, um, that band would come to Toronto and play a place called the Bamboo Club. I don't know if anyone remembers the Bamboo on Queen Street. But uh, they would come to the jazz festival and play mm. the Bamboo, and I would be like front row center like, um, every single time. And then there was this one particular time when they brought this bass player who didn't really feel that comfortable with the music. Okay. Um, and I felt like I knew the music better than he did. <laughs> 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 so I got bold and, um, you know, the band took a break and then I went to the keyboard player, Andy mm. Mills. And, um, and I said, you know, I'd really be interested in playing this kind of music. Mm. Um, and he said, cool, uh, you know, send me a tape, a cassette tape. This is what we're talking about. This is like 94, 94, 95. So um, 
he said, you know, send me a tape and I'll listen to it and I'll send it to Steve and, and then maybe we can work something out. So I made this tape of like various gigs and different grooves that I play in these different bands and then I sent it to Andy. And, um, and he called, <laughs> he called a little bit later and was like, um, you know, I've got my own band and we're, uh, we're getting ready to, sh to record some demos in Washington, D.C. Would you be interested in flying out? And I was like, absolutely, <laughs> you know, whenever you want. So um, Andy sent me four songs, and this is very interesting. So he sent me four songs, um, complete demos, um, where he would send the actual demo with all the parts. And then when the demo finished, you would just get the drum track. Mm -hmm. So then you would have the whole tune, and then you would learn the drum part, and then he did that with all four tunes. Um, so I learned all that music, and I learned the chants. And then we got to the studio. I flew to DC and recorded these four tunes. Um, and that was sort of my audition. But then those demos ended up being uh, on an album called The New Age of Aquarius. And that was the first time I had recorded uh, with Andy Milne and his band Dap Theory. Okay. And Andy Milne is, he's a Toronto musician, right? Yeah, he's originally from here. Um, and then I guess. I think the story goes he went to Banff as a participant mm. and Steve was on the faculty and Andy was just like, that's where I want to go. He sure. basically sort of followed Steve around and then right. worked his way into the band, which is kind of what I did with Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to linger on this a little bit. Okay. Like, I think like there is sort of a, a circle of people around Steve Coleman and uh, that have very much like embraced that uh, approach to music, and I think the same as, as you mentioned, Andy Milne being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes me think of the culture of mentorship that occurs in this music, uh, just more broadly. You know, you think yeah. about uh, the way that um, young musicians would go to Thelonious Monk's house or something. Right. Right. You know, in New York in the 50s, or uh, you know, I'd hear stories of guitar players from the 70s just making pilgrimages to a uh, great guitar player. Oh God, George, what is his name? Benson. Benson. Benson was the was the go-to guy in yeah, the 70s yeah. and 80s. Right, yeah. Every every jazz guitar player who wanted to go somewhere would go there, and so, and there was there is this sir, and you know, Joe Farnsworth great right. swing jazz player, mm -hmm. talks endlessly about Art Taylor and how, and how much he you know, embraced learning from this singular person. Um, and I wonder if you can just speak on that a little bit, just about mentorship, the value of having that sort of like one-to-one -one connection in music. And is that <laughs> something that you experienced or do you feel like it was valuable in your, your life? Uh, it was very valuable in my life. Um, when I was 22, um, a, a guy in town named Bill Grove gave me my first uh, opportunity um, to play in a band downtown professionally. And um, he, he was part of a band called White Noise, which was a band that played like kind of sort of Ornette Coleman influenced funk where there'd be like this really driving groove mm. without a particular key center. So it was very, it was like a very organized kind of chaos. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I really dug it. I was really into it. Mm. And he had his own radio show. So um, I would phone him up on a weekly basis and just like request certain things. <laughs> and he kind of clued in and was like, oh, wait a minute, are you a bass player? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he, he goes, uh, are you any good? And I, I didn't know how to answer that question. So Hell I, yeah, I'm I good. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of said, yeah. <laughs> um, so he said, listen, uh, I've got this band, but the bass player just left the band because he's going on the road with Dan Hill. Um, so if you're interested, come on out and audition for the band. He didn't know me from Adam. Mm. He just like invited me out to his place. Uh, and we played. But, you know, I'd been learning music just in my basement by myself, like listening to records and picking up things that way. 
Um, so when I got to the audition, we played, we just improvised, and, and everything was really clicking, you know, and sounding great. And then Bill said, um, uh, let's try this tune. And he pulled out a piece of paper that had all this, like, notation and... Mm. And I'm telling you, I didn't know, you, I couldn't tell you where G was on <laughs> an E string. Like, I didn't know anything about the bass, I just knew how to play it. So he put this piece of paper down in front of me and I was like, I don't know what to do with this. And then he counted the band in and I still didn't know what to do. Mm. So, you know, we got through a few bars of the tune and I was just sort of standing there like an idiot. And he said, hold up, stop. You don't know how to read? And I was like, no, I mean, I, I learned how to play this instrument by ear. And he said, okay, you got the gig, but we rehearse every, I think Saturday, I think it was. We rehearse every Saturday at noon. I want you here at 11 o'clock. And I would show up every week an hour early before the rehearsals, and he would sit me down at the piano mm. and just teach me like the basics of theory. Um, and that was so important to me. Mm. Like Bill Grove will always be um, probably the most important figure in my my musical development. Okay. Um, because he showed me all that stuff and really gave me a basic understanding of, of you know, theory and mm. harmony, which I didn't know at all. Um, so, you know, he was my mentor. And then, you know, years later, I saw um, a clinic with the great bassist Dave Holland. And one of the things that he said was, um, He's got this, this sort of philosophy that he lives by where um, you pass it on. Mm. You know, all the information that you've gained, you got to pass it on. And, you know, that's sort of been my whole thing. I've learned so much from, you know, I've been so fortunate to work with all these, these musicians who think of music in unconventional ways. And to have that knowledge and keep it to myself just seemed silly. So uh, I'm fortunate to be in a position where now I, you know, I teach at U of T and at Humber College and I have, you know, ensembles that I teach and I try to um, show some of these kind of unconventional ideas to the students and maybe help them to think in music, think of music in a different way. Mm. Which is really cool because I see a lot of them sort of struggling with with certain things. But then when you sort of uh, flip the script, mm. it might turn on a light bulb and allow them to approach something in a way that, that might make it easier for them. Um, and I love that. I love to see the light bulbs going off. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm all about passing it all. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about like, you know, um, just trying to give this information to younger musicians who sure. can then do with it whatever they want and maybe come up with something completely new that they can then pass on to another generation. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, your YouTube channel is a testament to that as well. Like, Thank you. Definitely passing on a ton of information there. So yeah. yeah. I've learned a lot from that as well. Thank you. Um, okay. So, I mean, you mentioned, this is a good segue, you mentioned, you know, having some sort of left of center uh, approaches to the instrument, approaches to music. You've had the opportunity to play with a whole array of different people who approach music, you know, in quote unquote unconventional ways. Um, I noticed that you yourself have a, oftentimes I would say like an unconventional approach. You play solo bass, uh, which is not something that happens an awful lot right. uh, for us bassists. And in your first piece, this. Uh, you know, you were using a whole bunch of what I would maybe consider extended techniques, mm -hmm. um, chording and uh, sort of like playing rhythm and melody simultaneously. And uh, and I wonder if you could talk about how you came to using exploring some of those ideas on the instrument. Sure. Um, I let's see. I was on the road uh, with a band, and we toured a lot of folk festivals across the country. And the thing about touring folk festivals is that you end up um, touring with a lot of the same bands. <laughs> and um, um, there was this, this guitar player from Madagascar. Uh, his name is Degary, D apostrophe uh, G 
G-A-R-Y. Mm. He's phenomenal. And, um, you know, I saw him perform at one festival, and then we got to the next festival, and he was at this one. And, like, we just sort of kept following each other all the way. But I was at every single performance. And he had this way of playing um, that made the guitar, like, he played, like, an acoustic uh, steel string uh, guitar. And the way that he played, like, he just made the instrument sound like all of these African instruments. Mm. You know, in one tune, he'd make the guitar sound like a chord. And then in the next tune, it would sound like a balafon. Mm. And then a, like a marimba. And I, you know, I would just sit at the front of the stage and watch him and the way that he played. And he was using this sort of picking technique with his thumb and forefinger, but then also muting the strings. Mm. Um, and just playing all these beautiful patterns, you know. Um, so he didn't speak English, and I didn't speak his language. Um, but we did communicate on some level, and I ended up, you know, buying his records, and, and um, you know, he showed me a couple of things just to practice, and that has really um, opened up a whole new world because mm -hmm. I started using this technique. And thinking, you know, that the bass now sounds um, not at all like a bass. Mm. But that, I feel like that sort of sent me in a new direction because, I mean, first of all, <laughs> I play six string electric bass. Mm. So I get a lot of heat for that already, right? Like people say, oh, that's not a bass. Why don't you just play guitar? <laughs> all these things, all these things. That too I many really strings. Yeah, too many strings. Like yeah. Um, so if people are going to dog me and say that this doesn't sound like a bass, well then, yeah, yeah I'll go with that. Yeah, sure. I'll try to make this bass sound like as many other instruments as possible. Sure. But I still, you know, I mean, I have the tradition under my fingers. I know, you know, how to groove, whatever. Um, so I just started to get into like as many different sounds as possible. Mm. And so like. What other sounds did you find yourself gravitating to? Uh, well, I'll, you know what? I'll play something. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, one of the one of the sounds that I really got into was the sound of Joe Zawinul. Okay. Who was the um, the leader? Was the leader and the keyboard player of this band called Weather Report um, that featured Jaco Pistorius on bass, like my hero. Um, but he had these amazing keyboard sounds. And he also had this really beautiful way of playing that was just so like linear and uh, linear, but like, you know, using very wide intervals yeah. and just a, like a completely different sound. So uh, I tried to get into some of that and then it didn't really make sense to me on the bass. Um, and then I started to incorporate like different effects and pedals and things like that and started to get a little bit closer to what I was hearing on those old recordings. Cool. So um, I'm going to play a thing now that I kind of think of as a meditation. I like to practice this every once in a while uh, and when I play it at home it can last for whatever, anything from five minutes to like an hour because it really sort of puts me in a zone. Um, so just like tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this doesn't have a name, but uh, you'll hear you'll hear you know what I'm talking about. This is not going to sound like a bass, and I love that. Uh, so here we go.
Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I totally hear what you mean, like referencing Joe Zaw and all, like those wide intervallic yeah. spaces, but still extremely melodic. And oh, I love that. Song. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's that's really. I hear it. I hear it. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, okay, back to my notes. Yeah, back to the notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. One thing that I found myself thinking about as you were playing mm -hmm. is uh, the band that you were touring those folk festivals with. Oh, yeah. Um, Auto Rickshaw, I'm assuming. That's the band. Yeah. So uh, that's how I discovered you. Oh, cool. Okay. Was uh, at the Winnipeg Folk Festival. That's right. 2005, 
six, yeah, something, something like that. that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm not as young as I feel. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I remember being just, I remember hearing you from afar playing with this band. And I was a bass player, young bass player. And think, oh, the only thing I could think of was like, who the hell is this <laughs> bass player? Uh, and so I ran to the stage, not walked, I ran. Um, and was instantly, you know, obviously inspired. And, uh, yeah. and so begun, you know, my, let's say, love affair with your music. Uh, <laughs> but uh, all of that aside, my gushing aside, the thing that I wanted to ask you about was maybe what you learned from that band. Oh, wow. Well, I, I learned a lot because Auto Rickshaw was a band that was sort of um, uh, getting into a music that has now come to be known as Indo Jazz, where the band was basically made up of myself on this instrument uh, and a classical Indian vocalist, Asiba Shankaran, um, and two percussionists, a tabla player, Ed Hanley, and, um, and an auxiliary, auxiliary uh, percussionist named Debashish uh, Sinha. And that was the band. So it was just like bass, vocals, and drums. Mm. Um, <coughs> so, you know, we were playing these sort of traditional Indian uh, songs, and I didn't know a whole lot about that music. So I would sit with uh, Suba, the vocalist, mm. And um, and she would teach me sort of the nuances of the melodies and like how to get some of the ornamental inflections and and um, learn the you know traditional ragas and uh, some of the different rhythmic cycles that happen on the tabla. Um, yeah, I learned a lot from that band. I learned a lot about Indian music from that band. Mm. And I feel like every opportunity that I have to learn something new stays with me, like mm. no matter what musical situation I might be playing in. Like there are things that I learned in that band that I played, you know, on gigs with, uh, you know, like a funk band. Sure. Or, uh, a band that played like, whatever, West African music. There are, li there are little sort of universal things that I can just sort of grab onto and then use uh, in any situation, mm. which is, you know, for me, that's how I feel like I was able to develop my own voice on the instrument mm. because I found those things that I could use universally, I guess. Um, and I started to get a reputation for that mm. because, um, you know, the ideas that I was getting were not necessarily bass-oriented ideas. They were ideas that had to do with either rhythm or melody. And, um, you know, when you start learning melodies that are sort of indigenous to different cultures, um, it can really change the way that you just, like, play any sort of simple thing, mm. you know? So I just started using that, like, wherever I went and no matter what the musical situation was. And, you know, nobody told me to stop, so sure. I just kept going. Right. <laughs> Uh, no, that's very cool. And I mean, you spent time also playing with Redresh. Yeah, absolutely. As well, and that, I mean, I can only imagine there was a connection between those two bands. Somewhere. Yeah, oh, uh, not directly, but as far as, you know, the knowledge that I gained with Auto Rickshaw definitely helped me when I got to Redresh's band. Right. Um, he's doing something a little bit more uh, modern. Um, in fact, it's it's like Indo jazz that's very much influenced by Steve Coleman. Right. Um, so that was his thing, and I felt like you know it, it was a great fit that I finally got to <laughs> explore some of these ideas, and then some of the ideas that I learned from you know playing with Andy and playing with Steve. And sure. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I mean he sounds an awful lot like Steve Coleman in a lot of ways. He does. Here's the cool thing. I mean we're sort of all on this journey together, right? right. We're all sort of just finding finding our own voice, discovering our own voice. Mm. So he's, you know, he, uh, he definitely has that influence, mm. that Steve Coleman influence. But he's 
you know, he's learned the tradition of his own background. Mm. And he plays these ideas, and he could be playing, you know, like now he's on the road with this band uh, called the Hero Trio. Just oh, yeah. Yeah, saxophone, bass, and drums. And he's playing tunes like, you know, Faith by George Michael, right? <laughs> but when he plays them, it just, like, it sounds like Rudresh. It sounds like you, you hear the melody of this very familiar tune, but you also hear that influence of Steve Coleman. You hear, you know, traditional Indian melodies in the way that he likes to phrase and, mm. and play the saxophone. And it's just, it's so hip to see that happening because it just means that, you know, we're all doing this together. We're all sort of um, on this path of development. Mm. You know? And um, yeah, and you know, Redresh is a really good friend and we support each other in the, uh, you know, biggest possible ways that we can. I was just in New York and we were trying to link and get together for lunch, and it just couldn't happen. But, but yeah, we talk all the time. Mm. Miss that dude. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so on the t on the subject of listening widely and being aware of an array of music and trying to find your own voice mm -hmm. through that process of, you know, uh, breadth and. Uh, musical eclecticism, I guess. Um, like, can you maybe talk a little bit about how that's informed, like, your radio show and the way that you think about oh sharing, wow. you know, your love of a variety of musics with, with the world? Uh, yeah. Um, well, the radio show, this is cool, the radio show started on Jazz Cast, and, um, and now it's on Jazz FM which is mind-blowing for me. <laughs> Tuesday nights <laughs> at 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I have this show every week. And you know, it started, you know, when it started on JazzCast, I was just sort of exploring all these different ideas and different genres and things like that. But then, you know, with New Origins, I felt like there was an opportunity to, um, acknowledge a lot of the innovators that happened like after all the names that we know in traditional jazz. Mm. Like when Miles started incorporating jazz, or sorry, uh, like funk and R&B into his music, he was not the only one, you know? And there were a lot of different artists who just never got their due, mm. who were making, you know, incredible music, uh, like, late 60s, early 70s, uh, even into the 80s. And, and I like finding those gems from those artists and really sort of focusing on um, playing that music for the show. But I also like the idea of um, highlighting the artists of today who were definitely influenced by those artists. So that's why the show is called New Origins, because it's it's jazz, but it's not the traditional jazz. It's like a certain period where, where this real kind of revolution took place, like in the 70s, where jazz met uh, funk and gospel, R&B and soul, and, and all these forms of black music that like I grew up on, mm. you know? Um, so that's, I mean, that's for me, that's really what the show is about. I can't remember the rest of the question. No, no, <laughs> that, that covers it, really, in, in a very <laughs> real sense. I think that covers it. So, like, one of the, th like, one of the things that we're always talking about in, and when I say we, I mean, like, people in my program at the, at the Faculty of Music at the University of Toronto, we're always trying to think about ways of rethinking the canon, I guess, okay. and, like, what it means to even have a canon and, like, questioning, like, who gets chosen to be canonized, and where does this come from? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, what, like, how does this narrative get constructed? You know, of like going from, I don't know, um, let's say Buddy Bolden to Louis Armstrong to 
Coleman Hawkins to Charlie Parker to Miles Davis yeah. to Sonny Rollins to John Coltrane to Ornette Coleman and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then it really just stops at Ornette Coleman. No one talks about anything else until you get to Wynton Marsalis. That's it. And yeah. that's like, that is the canon as we are taught in music school, as it is discussed in, you know, many, many jazz clubs in the community in some real sense. And so I think like, you know, that's a narrative that we are kind of given, mm -hmm. but don't necessarily have to swallow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think what you're doing is a real testament to that and, and speaks very strongly to the fact that like, you know, there's this, like again, in the history books, like oftentimes there's this window of time between Bitches Brew and, <laughs> uh, and when Wynton Marsalis comes out that people just don't talk about. Yeah. It's like 67 to 79 just don't exist in jazz. But re in reality, like, there's a whole array of different things. And in some ways, it's like almost like the most fertile time. Yeah. I mean, you know, people don't talk enough about Pharaoh Sanders or Gary Bartz or Roy Ayers. Like, these guys were real innovators. Mm. And I think, you know, I'm always sort of going back to the unconventional. I think maybe because this new form of music was in such a developmental stage uh, and Miles had such a huge name that, you know, he was the guy. And, and the other dudes sort of just fell to the wayside because maybe they were too weird or not popular enough or whatever. But, um, you know, when I listen to that music now, I just think, man, why, how is this not part of the canon. Mm -hmm. Wh why are we not learning about the music of Pharaoh Sanders in college, you know? Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I find a lot of times uh, students uh, in these music programs get frustrated with the curriculum because they just don't identify with it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, they're taught about. Charlie Parker and Coltrane, and and that's not part of their uh, that's not part of their musical history. So it's they almost feel like they have to like it, and they're not allowed to say, "Well, I don't really dig this." Mm. Um, so you know, when I get into those situations with students who <laughs> kind of complain about the curriculum, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I try to introduce you to some stuff that might be a little bit more modern. Mm. and, um, you know, incorporate some of the music that, that they're more familiar with. Right. So that they can identify with it and get excited about it. Because, you know, that's the one thing, I think I talked about this in um, the, uh, the seminar that we did. Um, but there's a danger of students forgetting the reason why they got into the music because they get so beat down with all the academia mm. that the magic and the love for music and the enthusiasm for music is gone because there's all this stuff that they feel like they have to learn or else they can't be real musicians, you know? Yeah, like going from deadline to deadline yeah. where like music becomes a homework assignment instead of like a thing that you do for yeah. like as, you know, a passion that you believe in. Yeah, so I always, you know, I always try to remind my students, like, you have to remember why you picked up the instrument in the first place. And don't let all the academia beat you down because, you know, I mean, the information is important, but uh, I don't know. If, if it's not something that you're really feeling, mm. um, it might not be the end all be all if you don't get into it. Because you'll find that path mm. that will allow you to sort of find your voice and allow you to explore and discover and really um, create in a way that you feel um, emotionally connected to the music. Sure, and like that's a way of staying, just to build on your point, like that's a way of staying in the music longer, I think. Absolutely. You know, I just to kind of reinforce your point, like, um, 
speaking personally, I started playing this music through my love of fusion music. I started as an electric bass player. Mm -hmm. I was very into like Mahavishnu Orchestra, Weather Report, these bands from the 70s that like, you know, really informed the way that I wanted to play music and it connected to, you know, contemporary music in a way that I understood. Um, and then like, it becomes an, an unfolding process where you're like, how did we get to this point? And then you kind of like dig back a little bit and you're like, oh, I see like these people were playing with these people. Yeah, and then you yeah. dig a little bit further back and you're like, oh, that this like came out of this. And then you dig a little further back and like, you kind of piece together mm -hmm. knowledge in this sort of like excavating way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so now it's like you can. I like I find I like go back and listen to I don't know Fats Waller or something, and it's like oh Ooh. damn this is heavy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because I see what it informed. Right. Yeah, and that's I mean, for me, that's what I love hearing about like. Um, the music that's being created by young musicians today. Mm. Because, you know, a lot of times you hear that connection. And sometimes you hear that connection even if those young artists are not familiar with the canon. Sure. Right? Yeah. They're probably influenced by musicians who were influenced by the canon. And maybe they don't know anything about Fats Waller or, or even John Coltrane. But yeah. they've discovered their own way to this music. Um, and in doing so, they've created something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings um, like Domi and JD back to mind. Yeah, man. Oof. Very uh, different. Very different. Modern I wish we could play some for you. This is these yeah. two like very young, extremely proficient musicians uh, who just make chaos music, but it's really <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So we just got the twenty minute. Uh, Mark here. Do you want to play one more thing and then maybe we can op open up for questions? Sure. Okay. I'll play one more thing. All right. Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have a loop pedal here. And um, I made this loop a little while ago. Um, and I was afraid that it wouldn't work. <laughs> so uh, before I left the house, I put the loop in the machine and I turned it on at the beginning of this. It's been running the whole time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because I was too afraid that it wouldn't work. So here's the loop. And uh, maybe you know this tune. This is a cover tune um, from a really amazing band from Sweden. That's all I'm going to say. All right. <laughs> Thank you. 
that's a, that's a cover of a, a song by Little Dragon called Twice, mm. which is such a gorgeous tune. Um, you can look it up on YouTube. The video is absolutely beautiful. And I think that song was released in like 2009. Mm. And when I first heard it, I thought I needed to do something with this. Um, so I didn't really change anything. I mean, that's the tune. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a gorgeous piece of music. Yeah, and you play it beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I gotta check that record. I really love Little Dragon, so I'm gonna check Me that. Me too, man. Um, yeah, talk about drawing inspiration from anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think it is that time for questions from the audience. Um, does anyone? Okay, Christine. You uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. I think the oh. mic is for the. Okay. Oh. First of all, thank you so much for those pieces. That was absolutely beautiful. Like thank I you. felt that in my throat. Oh. It was so good. <laughs> like <laughs> uh, I also want to talk later about the pedal game because I'm a sucker for like arrangements of loopers and the footwork in music. Oh yeah. And I guess my question is also yeah physically about physically how you arrive to these performances. I know where I met artists are a little bit sick of fielding and COVID the shift to digital performance how has that changed? But I am really interested in the differences of how you arrive to like an in person performance versus streaming versus radio, which is different. Yeah. You know that than now performing on YouTube here and since to return to the physicality of that performance. So much of it is contingent on the acoustics of the space mm -hmm. and how your body arrives there. I was wondering if you could take us through the differences of li physical liveness and radio and streaming. Yeah, yeah. well, Thank you. I mean, you know, everyone says live is, is best. And I totally agree with that. Um, you know, as far as the differences, I, you know, I try I try to approach um, like online performance and live performance in the same way because, um, well, you know, there's an audience. There's always an audience. And I feel like there are times, uh, even in live situations, um, but certainly in streaming situations, where, where people forget the audience. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing for me. Um, you know, you, you set up an opportunity to perform for people and then you put the word out that this performance is happening. And then people like all of you see this advertisement and you too. Uh, and then you say to yourself, you know, I think I want to check that out. I think I want to support this person. Um, and I cannot tell you what that means to me. Like, I'm so honored that you're all here. Um, and I feel the same way when I approach uh, an online performance. The audience is there. And I want to make sure I am the best that I can be uh, for all of you. Because, you know, to say that it's an honor is a huge understatement. And I don't want to take the audience for granted. Uh, I want to be present. Um, I want to be inside the music. And I want to try to create an emotional connection to that music that everyone can experience at the same time. Um, because that's, to me, that's when music is like um, at its best. That's when art is at its best, when the artist and the listener or the audience can really have the same experience with the music. Mm. And I sort of take the same approach with radio. I get really excited about finding these sort of rare gems <laughs> and just, you know, you know, putting it away and saying, oh man, I can't wait to play this for people. Wait till they hear this. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. So, you know, uh, for me, it's, it's all about the audience. It's all about the audience. Like, because, I don't know, like what better job? Mm -hmm is there than being a musician. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very long, <laughs> a very long-winded answer, but uh, I hope it answers the question. Thank you. 
You're very welcome. Is there any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Thank you so much for the music and the insights. Fascinating Thank and beautiful. You. Um, you guys have talked a lot about voice uh, and your exposure to a range of influences, um, trying to make the bass sometimes sound like other instruments. How did you discover your voice as an artist? Is it something that you heard, like that you noticed your own distinctness? Or did, was it something that other people had to tell you, like, oh man, you're, you're doing something really unique, that you know, you have a voice? Um, I, you know, I think it's different for different people. For me, it was out of necessity, because when I started playing this instrument, I was really into Jaco Pistorius. And I, you know, I learned all the, the weather report stuff, all the Joni stuff, like I had all that stuff down. Um, and I was 19, I think, uh, and I was really sort of <laughs> stupidly thinking that I had discovered this guy that not a lot of people knew about. So I went out uh, into the real world and just started playing all this Jocko stuff. And then I would hear other bass players also playing all this Jocko stuff <laughs> better than me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I got to do something else. I have to find something else. So then I started listening to other bass players. And when you start at the top and then check out some of the other players that, you know, to, to me just didn't have the same uh, connection for me, uh, it became a very sort of frustrating thing. So I just stopped listening to bass players altogether and just tried to gain as many diverse in influences from different instruments as possible. And I think that sort of some of the influences allows for one to sort of find their own thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Questions in the audience? Anyone else have a question? Uh, are there any online questions? I guess they're not coming through. No online questions, all right. Um, okay, well, I think that covers us for today. Okay. What's next? What's next for you? Uh, I get on a plane on Sunday and go to London. I'm playing um, Ronnie Scotts mm -hmm. with a drummer named Larna Lewis uh, and his band. Um, we play. Where are we playing? We do three shows. Um, playing a place called Bird uh, in Rotterdam. And then um, the, uh, I'm forgetting the name now, the Jazz Ahead series, which is happening somewhere in Europe. And then we have like a, a video shoot to do in, Ber in Berlin. Uh, and then we come home. That's next for me. Um, after that, I've kind of been working away on another solo album, like another solo bass album. Uh, so a lot of my time is going to be dedicated to that now that school is out. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Are you doing any more duo stuff with uh, Lewis yeah. Brown? Yeah, I mean we'd like to, but you know he's he's busy with the Snarkies, and I'm you know on my own path as well. Sure. So whenever we can get together, right? Uh, we do it. Um, but we would love to. We'd love to record an album and and tour and just, you know, spend more time together making music. That's my brother, man. Yeah. Like, I love that dude. Yeah, I may have a question for Sam. Yeah. So we, we've all heard about how the pandemic has been transformative of the way musicians relate to their audience, the way in which we also worried mm -hmm. about the, the, so how did you survive and are they, are they lessons learned from, from the last two years that you want to, share with young musicians? Wow. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, I, well, you know, when everything stopped, I kind of panicked and thought I have to do something, you know, a real sort of sink or swim. Um, so I tried to just create opportunities where I was playing, but also, you know, trying to keep the fridge full and the lights on. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I, s I started the YouTube channel 
in hopes that that would be like a valid sort of stream of revenue. And that kind of parlayed into other opportunities where now I, you know, I, I write monthly for Bass Player Magazine. Um, uh, and I do, you know, some different things that allow me to just sort of make money where, where you know, uh, where I don't have to play on stage mm -hmm. because I didn't think I was going to be able to play on stage again, you know? Yeah. Um. <laughs> 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 that piano player's got some work. Um, <laughs> you know, as far as advice for young musicians, um, you know, perseverance is everything. And, and believe in what you do. Um, because w when you believe in it, you can sell it, and then other people will believe in it. If, you, if you're writing music just for money or just you know, because you're bored or whatever, um, things might not turn out the way that you plan. But if you really believe in what you do, um, people will notice that. Yeah, there's like no room for cynicism in art. Yeah, I don't think so. All right. Yeah. Words to live by. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. well, thank you so much. This was a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. session, both to Rich and Sam. Let's thank them. <laughs> <laughs>